Everybody would, we're gonna do page 187 in the garden. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear y'all clumping up a little better this crowd over here is just rebelling now the rebellious bunch look over there amen it's good to be here i'm glad you're here as you can hear i can talk a little bit amen god's good my wife said yeah but he was better last week <laughs> oh mercy it's good to be here i'm glad you're here tonight and i'm excited because uh, and here in just a few minutes we get to start a brand new study that I'm excited about, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But before we do, anybody got a prayer request or a praise report we need to to hear tonight? I'm sorry. Praise God! It's a praise. Amen. Somebody made it through basic training. Amen. That's good. Yes, ma'am. Who was somebody over here? 
Oh, right here. Uh, remember my aunt, uh, Deborah Lovett, she lost her son oh. yesterday. David Lovett, she was 16, she was 65. But they're not church people, and you know, giving up a child. Mm. So I'm concerned about all the aunts and cousins. Amen, let's remember that. My name is Deborah Preacher. I'm going to test tomorrow. Okay. Amen. Yes, remember that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, someone had, his police aunt had asked for the church to pray for this little girl named Addie. I don't know her last name, what it is, but God knows. Amen. Just Addie. Amen. I know who Addie is. That's a good one. Amen. Anybody else? Remember, Nina, she's sick and she's not so loud. Okay. Let's remember that. Amen. I like to hear that. That's good news. Amen. Remember Cecil tomorrow because of first Tristan. Okay. All right. Let's remember that. All righty. Yes, sir. All righty. Let's remember that. Uh, pray for. Uh, okay. Let's remember that. Remember Vanessa, I know she she probably don't want us to talk too much about it, but I know she's been sick for two days, and if you've been in the office any time at all, you know I miss Vanessa when she's not here. And so uh, let's pray that she'll get miraculously healed, <laughs> amen, and, uh, and get back in. So if you call and nobody answers the phone, it doesn't mean nobody's here. Either I'm on the line with somebody else, or I can't figure out how to change lines. So it's one <laughs> Or the other, uh, if you try to, I'm just being honest about it, so uh, be patient. But let's pray for her. Pray the Lord to get her back here as soon as possible. All righty, let's go to the Lord in prayer. All right, Lord, we love you. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. And uh, Father, we thank you for our church, uh, for our church family. Uh, God, what a privilege. It really is a privilege that we can worship you in, uh, in this place tonight. And uh, God, I'm glad when I pulled up on the property uh, this evening, I, I couldn't hardly wait to get in here because I enjoy uh, the fellowship. No, not just fellowship with my brothers and sisters, I love that, but to have fellowship with you. And I'm thankful tonight um, that we can meet here and, and have fellowship. Uh, we can pray together and sing together and, and study your word. And so I don't want to ever want to take for granted. Uh, God, I pray that we would... Uh, we would bind together and we'd be a people of worship uh, as we meet here together. And so, uh, Father, just help us tonight, forgive us of our sins. Father, we pray for cleansing and uh, uh, God, that you'd get us where we need to be, that there's nothing between uh, our soul and our Savior, uh, that we may be able to approach the throne boldly. Because there's folk that need help. And you know, we've heard a lot of names mentioned here tonight and a lot of different things. God, first, we thank you for answered prayer, for the praise reports. And, uh, Lord, I love it when people come back to church and just give God the glory because the test results were, um, Father, they were better or, um, Father, they were good. And we know that all comes from you. So we thank you for that tonight. And we do pray for those that are hurting and those, uh, some that have tests coming up. You know all about them, and we pray, God, that you would help them and uh, that they'd get good results as well. And, uh, Father, just tonight, we do pray for all those that are sick and hurting, and most of all tonight, God, we pray for those that are lost. Um, Lord, I pray that we would have a heart for, for lost people in our community, our neighbors and our friends and our families, and um, that, God, we would make it a personal goal is to share the gospel with them and let them know that Jesus loves them and died for them and rose again. And even right now, he can save them. There's no one, I believe, Lord, with beyond the reach of Christ in the finished work of Calvary. So help us tonight, I pray, uh, to remember to pray for them always and to witness to them wherever we go. We pray for our nation tonight, all of our leaders, uh, Father, our church, and our church leadership, our local folk. We lift them all up to you tonight, God, and pray a special touch on them. Give them wisdom in leadership. Uh, we pray tonight. Now, meet with us here, God. Open our minds and our hearts to the things of God. Help us to learn and to glean things from your word and from each other uh, that will carry us through, uh, Lord, until we get to see you. Because the word tells us that when we see him, we'll be like him. 
So, Father, tonight, that's what we're looking for. We love you now. We praise you. Thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm excited tonight. I told you uh, we're going to be looking. I, I, I just finished up a few days ago um, <clears throat> a study in, in the book of John, and I went through, I don't know how many times I've read the book of John, uh, quite a few, but anyway, so I thought, man, what am I going to do? And I hadn't read the Old Testament in a long time, so I started in the Old Testament, and I got into the book of, of Samuel, and that's one of my favorite Old Testament books, and uh, First and Second Samuel, uh, because I love the story of David. I think uh, King David is a fascinating study, and uh, I've studied it a lot, done some, done some, uh, some just some can studies, if you will. There's studies out there on on King David. But one of the funnest things I've ever done is just go through and do a study myself. And so I've been praying about what to do on Wednesday night since we got done with the James McDonald study. And I thought, man, Wednesday night is a great night for Bible study because we don't have to be in too big a hurry. And the lighter it gets outside, the less hurry we'll be in too. And, um, and I thought, man, David is a great study because it, it doesn't matter how young or how old you are. Uh, we can look at David together, and we can learn so much. And so I thought about that, and one of my favorite statements, not in just the Old Testament, but all the Scripture is where we learn that David was a man, what, after God's? That's right. Uh, and so I thought about that, and I thought, man, that'd be a great study, just a man or woman, um, but a man after God's own heart. So I thought about it, uh, and I I thought, well, for our series, I think our text is going to be Acts 13, 22. If you want to turn there, and we're going to, we're going to start right there. And like I said, this will be a good uh, series text. And then we'll go down and read in 1 Samuel chapter 16. But we'll start here, and we may read this every Wednesday night until we get it. Um, Acts chapter 13 and verse number 22. Uh, and we're going to be looking at uh, some different um, stories about David, if you will, uh, but tonight we're, we're going to talk about how God chooses. That's going to be our our study for tonight, and it'll change uh, every Wednesday night. Um, David, a man after God's own heart, Acts thirteen twenty two, and when he when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony, and said, "I found David the son of Jesse." A man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Think about that. No pressure, right? <laughs> no pressure there from the Lord. I found a man, David, after my own heart, who will fulfill what? All my will. Wow. What a statement to, for God to say that about anybody. I don't know that you read that about anybody else in all the scripture aside from the Lord Jesus Christ. And so David is, again, a fascinating study. And, and I think one of the things that we can learn is that God wants every one of his children uh, to, to become a person after his own heart. You agree with that? I think God, I want God to say about James that James is a man after my own heart. You know what? I'll... I want the ear of God. Don't get me wrong. When I pray, I want God to hear me. But let me tell you, if you've got God's heart, or if you're after his heart, you definitely got his ear. Amen. And so um, I want that. I want God to say that about me. I'm a long way from that. But I, I thought about this. 3,000 years ago, God chose uh, a young man named David uh, to be the king of Israel. And out of all the sons of Jesse... Uh, the favor of God landed on David. And David was, as you know, the youngest son of a poor farmer from a, from a tiny little uh, hamlet uh, in, of Bethlehem. And David was a young man who wasn't even respected by the members of his own family. Uh, I like this statement. David was a nobody in a family of nobodies <laughs> he was kind of if you will he was kind of the lowest nobody uh in a, in a place that wasn't uh you know it certainly wasn't new york city of the time uh, matter of fact it may not even have been the oneida of its time uh so here you got a bunch of people from nowhere or a bunch of nobodies 
from nowhere, and David was the youngest nobody. Uh, wow. That gives me hope. Amen. I told somebody I love the study of David because it, David messed up so much. It makes me feel good uh, because if God can use David, there's hope for James. Amen. And so what a great study it is to be able to look at this, look at this man of God. Uh, but he was, he was. He was a nobody living in a family of nobodies. But by the grace of God, David, listen to this statement. David became the greatest king in the history of the nation of Israel. God has a thing for nobodies. I say it all the time. I'd rather be a nobody at the church house than to be a somebody in the White House. Amen. When it comes to the things of God, I like that God chooses those that nobody else will choose. And, and David also... Uh, Another cool thing, became an ancestor of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that, right? I mean, it wasn't that he was just the greatest king in Israel, but, but he was an ancestor of the Lord Jesus. He's listed among the great heroes of the faith in Hebrews 11. And during his life, uh, man, he received a lot of great promises, a lot of great blessings from the hand of the Lord. Um, so I, I tell you, uh, he was a great man of God. Uh, David... Uh, was the greatest of all, and, and he became a man after God's own heart. And that was not David's own testimony. David didn't say, hey, I'm a man after God's own heart. We read here in the book of Acts. The Lord said that David was a man after God's own heart. And I want to spend several Wednesday evenings, if we can, uh, trying to understand how this humble shepherd boy became a man after God's own heart. Uh, some people may wonder why we would even spend that much time on a fellow like David. Um, I think because David achieved in his life something that God wants every one of us to achieve, um, and that is to be, again, uh, that person that God can say that that person is after my own heart. So I want us to go to 1 Samuel now, chapter 16, because I... I could stay all day and talk about just the introduction um, in the Word of God. But 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse number 1, And the Lord said unto Samuel, How long wilt thou mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill thine horn with oil, and go, and I will send thee to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go if Saul hear it? He'll kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with thee, and say, I am come to sacrifice to the Lord. And call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I'll show, I'll show thee what thou shalt do, and thou shalt anoint unto me him whom I name unto thee. And Samuel did that which the Lord spake, and came to Bethlehem, and the elders of the town trembled, at his coming, and said, Comest thou peaceably? And he said, Peaceably, I am come to sacrifice unto the Lord. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. And it came to pass, when they were come, that he looked, and when they were, he looked, and Eliab, and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before me. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on his height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. Listen to this. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And Shema. Then Jesse made Shema to pass. And he said, Neither hath the Lord chosen. And again, Jesse, seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. And Samuel said unto Jesse, The Lord hath not chosen those. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for I will not sit down until he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. 
And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. The chapter opens, if you will, with God reminding Samuel of the fact that he's rejected Saul uh, to be king of Israel. Saul was chosen as a king. Do you know why? Because the people of Israel wanted a king. Was God in favor of that? Wasn't God's idea, wasn't God's plan. But man, listen, these folk, um, they wanted to be like the other nations around them. If you read 1 Samuel chapter number 8, you'll find out. Uh, up to that point, God had ruled the nation. He would raise up leaders as they would need them. And that's how things operated all the way from the time of Moses uh, through the days of the judges. And they were warned that elevating a man to the throne would bring back, uh, could bring political corruption and trouble. So Saul was chosen to be their king. The people were elated. You know why? Because he's, he was, he looked the part, right? Remember, remember we said, God said, men looks on the outside. Men, the men saw, Saul, Saul, how about that? <laughs> the men got to see him. And he was a physical specimen. He was, uh, according to the word of God, in 1 Samuel chapter number 9, uh, he, was, he was a big guy standing head and shoulders, taller than anyone else in Israel. And he may have been a giant among men, but he was a spiritual pygmy. <laughs> he, was a, he was very small. Uh, he was jealous. Uh, he lived for the praises of the people. Uh, he tended to overstep his boundary. He was guilty of gross disobedience when the Lord gave him a command. And as a, as a result, the Lord proved to Israel the dangers of a human uh, king, and God rejected Saul as king of his people. And as a result uh, of that Saul's rebellion, he chose a new king over Israel. And that's where we kind of pick up the story here um, when God chose somebody else to work for him. And so... Uh, but how did God choose? We just read that. How did God choose? If you're taking notes, I want you to write down uh, number one, verse one, God's choices are sovereign. I want you to see that, that God's choices, they're sovereign. His choice involves uh, sovereign providence. I want you to look at this. Uh, against the backdrop of rebellion and rejection that God begins the process of choosing a new king for Israel. He, he was ready to raise up a new king. The people had uh, been made ready to accept a new king. And so God worked behind the scenes during those days uh, in Israel and in the history of Israel to prepare the way for uh, his plan to be fulfilled. Think about that. Here is this, again, nobody in a family of nobodies from nowhere. And God was already formulating a plan to do that. You say, well, I've actually, actually thought about that. Why? I mean, out of everybody in the universe, why did God choose David? Well, the first answer I got is, well, I don't have a right to ask that question. <laughs> because God is sovereign in his choices, amen. God is sovereign in, in who he chooses to use. His choice involves sovereign providence. It was from the providence of God for everything to work together that he would be, he would be akin, earthly akin, if you will, to Jesus. And we're going to talk about that hopefully here in just a minute. But his choices involve sovereign providence, but also it involves sovereign, sovereign planning, Next, we're told uh, that Samuel, that he has to go find a new king. And for all intent and purposes, it appears that the Lord has been arranging everything because he knew exactly where to send him to. His chosen king, he knew he was going to bring him into the world at precisely the right moment in history. And if you look back at the ancestry of King David, you'll find that the hand of the Lord moving and shaping events to get to this place, one of David's ancestors, I don't know if you know this, is a, is a woman by the name of Rahab. You know, remember her? That was one of David's ancestors, was a lady. Mm, that's a term I probably shouldn't use there. Uh, it was a woman by the name of Rahab. 
Judges chapter 2. Uh, she had been saved out of, a, out of a, a pagan idolatry, and she was brought into the nation of Israel, and she married a man named Salmon, S-A-L-M-O-N. And she became the mother of a man named Boaz. See where this is going, don't you? And Boaz married a woman named, or a Gentile girl named Ruth. And Ruth and Boaz were the great-grandparents of a boy named David. See how God did all of that? Huh? I'm, we, we serve a God. I mean, people talk about planning. Man, how long did it take for all of this formulated plan to take place? I mean, this wasn't something that just happened overnight. Amen. I mean, God began in his, in his sovereign providence to put together a sovereign plan. Now, listen, folks, we, we are so into immediately. <laughs> we, we microwave our food. We email our packet, I mean, our, our, our mail. We, we're into now. God's not like that. Sometimes we need, we need to understand that God is not like that. Uh, he is. He he has he, he has sovereign providence, but he also has a sovereign plan, and his choices are sovereign. So here we see all these events that took place. They were not an accident. They were a part of a perfect plan formulated in eternity, so that all this stuff would work out. Uh, this was not a coincidence. It was the mighty hand of God. Amen. I get excited talking about that. And I have to remember it's Wednesday night, and I don't want to blow you all out of here because I could really preach right here. Uh, but I want you to get that, that we serve a God uh, who has a sovereign, he is sovereign in his choices. He has sovereign providence. He has sovereign planning, but he also has sovereign power. I want you to look at the word here uh, that he used, I have. Man, a lot of people got great plans. They have dreams. I mean, I, I have you have dreams and plans, right? Listen, I, I have a dream to own an island. And my plan is to have a huge boat to get me to and from the island. And then my plan is to have a big car to get me to the boat, to get me to the island. See, I got plans and I got dreams, but I like the power, right? I like the power. God has the power, period. <laughs> the Lord, what he purposes, he is well able to dispose. See, God rules in the affairs of men. Napoleon, at the height of his career, he's reported to have given a cynical answer to somebody who asked if God was on the side of France. <laughs> Napoleon said God is on the side that has the heaviest artillery. Then came the Battle of Waterloo where Napoleon lost both the battle and his empire. In later years, he was in exile on, uh, on an island he was pretty humbled and had been chasing pretty good. And he, he was reported to have quoted the words of Thomas Kempis. He said, man purposes, but God disposes. <laughs> Isn't that good? Man purposes, but God disposes. So what's the lessons we can learn from God's sovereign choices? Point number one. I think there are a few, and this kind of came in on the back end of me studying this, if you will. Um, I think that there are uh, three things that we can learn about God's sovereign choices and how God chooses. I think the first lesson is, is that there are no accidents in life. Write that down somewhere. Put it on your heart. I don't care where you write it. You can write it right beside this if you want to in the margin of your Bible. 
There are absolutely no accident in life. Everything that occurs is a part of a larger plan. God is working behind the scenes in ways that you and I cannot comprehend to accomplish his purposes. Amen. All things work together for good. We know whatever he's doing, it's for good to them that what? Love God who are called according to his what? purposes. It is his goodwill. It is his purpose. There is no, there are no accidents in life. Thank God for the truth that God is in absolute control. Look at me, church. You ought to shout on that right there, that no matter what happens tomorrow or next week or next month or next year, that the absolute control as believers for you and I is in God's hands. He, there, listen, God won't wake up in the morning and go, oops, I didn't see that one coming. Amen. He knows. There's no accidents. The second thing that we learn is that God is well able to bring his plan to pass. See, he'll never purpose a plan that he's not able to accomplish. Whether it's a plan to raise up a shepherd boy and make him a king or whether it's a plan to work out his will in your life and in my life, he's able to see it through. That's another reason I love to study the story of David. An unlikely, a very unlikely boy becomes the greatest king in all of history. We're going to talk about that too in just a minute. Third, God's sovereign. The third thing we learn from that is God's sovereign choices extend to every area of of life every single area I don't presume to understand it all but I believe the Bible teaches us that God is in the business of working all things according to his will and the reason he does that is to bring eternal purpose period I mean you live a hundred years and we're old and feeble and we think we've and God had he might have been planning that 3,000 years ago. <laughs> Isn't that something? I, I really believe that. I think God, he works everything to an eternal purpose. Uh, he has a way of doing that, and he'll bring his eternal purpose to pass in time. Some people get a little bothered by the notion that God is in absolute control of life. But I find that the most comforting thing about life. I've tried to, you ever try to live life on your own and by yourself? I have. It was fun until I got broke and beaten and battered and bruised and realized that maybe I didn't have the cover that I once had or the protection. I need a sovereign God to take care of me. Listen, I'm all right with God being in control. I really, I, folks, I believe that. But God is, his choices are sovereign. I'll give you the second thing here, moving right along. God's cho choices are also surprising. <laughs> Not only are they sovereign, but listen, Samuel is sent, is set and sent to Bethlehem to anoint a new king. And when he gets there, he, he really commands Jesse to gather all of his sons and they come before the old prophet and each one of them pass by one by one. And in this process, God makes known his choice for the king. But his choices, while they're sovereign, also kind of carry a little bit of surprise, if you will. Uh, verses uh, 6 through 10, you see, if you're taking notes, that his, choices, his choice is surprising in its rejections. The first son passes before Samuel. And just so you know, his name means God is father. Think about that. That's what his name means. Go home and look that up. I thought that was interesting. The first guy that comes by, he's a physical specimen. His name means God is father. And I would have been, I would have been, if I was Samuel, I would have thought, surely. I mean, that's perfect, right? That's like, okay, Lord, look at this guy. He looks like a king. People going to love this guy. You ever been around people like that? Maybe charismatic. And his name it means 
God his father. First one. And God said what? Nah. <laughs> Not him. That's kind of surprising. And then, he, God, as my, God doesn't just say, he says, I, I've refused him. That word means reject. He looked good outwardly, but there was something in his character that disqualified him from being king. And God said, I've, I've refused him. And then the next one that comes by, Benadab, his name means my father is noble. But he's passed over. He's rejected. The next guy, his name means astonishment. That might even refer to his physical size. I don't know that or some other physical trait. But no matter, he's rejected. Then one after another after another, surely these men are all physically fine. But they didn't have the requirements. They didn't have the character traits, if you will, that a holy God was looking for. So remember this when we talk about it being a surprise. Uh, God sees what man can't see. Even Samuel was impressed with Eliab, and, but God wasn't. And, and you'd have thought that Samuel would have learned his lesson with Saul, but he's still looking at men through his eyes instead of trying to look for a king through God's eyes. And, you know, before I'm too hard on him, I want you to know something. I'm the same way, aren't you? I'm the same exact way. When, when, <laughs> when I see a young man, handsome, well-spoken, intelligent, uh, I say, man, that young man, he, you know, he'll make a fine son-in-law. That's why I used to size him up. I mean, look at me and Mama. We're a little bit short. Well, we're not short. We're vertically challenged. I used to think, well, we need to, we need to, uh, we need to up our ante a little bit, right, Mama? I mean, we we size the boys up when we see them with our girls. We'd be like, mm, yeah, five nine, yep, keep moving, boy. But if you look at them, we didn't do very good because they all married vertically challenged, except for Brett. Amanda's here tonight. Praise God, he married a tall girl. Amen. There's hope for one basketball player out of a thousand. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. But, but we all do that stuff. Or I look sometimes at somebody and say, man, that young man will make a fine preacher. I can pick him out. I can pick him out of this, out of this area tonight. I can pick you out some preachers that in my mind, in my heart, I'll say, buddy, that one will be a fine preacher. That one will make a fine preacher someday. You know why? Because he meets my qualifications. But all I'm looking at is how his hair's cut, how his face is shaved, the clothes he wears, and how he carries himself. But let me tell you something. God the Father, he sees what I don't. <laughs> Isn't that good? Aren't you glad? He sees what we don't. See, I can't see the heart. We see a man He's saved, good to his family, been blessed in his work. He has some business sense. And we look at him and say, man, that man will make a good deacon. But again, God sees the heart. We judge people by how they strike the eye. God judges them on a whole different level. The person that I think will do great things in the church may not even make a blip on God's radar screen. While that one we think is not going to amount to anything, they could be used in a mighty way for God. So we have to be careful. Listen, his choices are surprising in its rejections, but also in its requirements. God tells Samuel that he, he doesn't look at the physical attributes of a man, but he looks at the character of the man's heart. And before Saul ever ceased being king, God had already determined to raise up a man with the right kind of heart. You see, as the sons of Jesse stood there that day, they all looked the part. But Samuel did not see the condition of their heart. And so as we go on, we understand that Eliab, he's critical, he's jealous, he's negative. First Samuel chapter 17, you just got to keep reading. You see his character flaw. He, he may have been a big man externally, but he was a big, 
He was a big baby. <laughs> How about that? He was a big baby. He wasn't the kind of man that God could use for his glory. Listen, listen. Man, it's a great lesson, not just for us as individuals, but for us as a church. Amen? When we start picking out people and saying, well, they, they work good here. I'm the world's worst. One of the worst decisions I ever made in my life is uh, <laughs> I hired a football coach because he was great with the kids on the football field, and, and he told me he was a preacher, and I hired this guy. I say, I hired him because I did. The church said, preacher, do what you want to. By the way, don't ever do that. I said, yeah, man, horrible mistake. The guy was terrible. Got me in more trouble. Got the church in trouble. He looked the part. He had the right words. But come to find out, he was just, he, he was just a big fat baby. <laughs> he wanted the title. But he didn't have the character to do the job. We have to be careful, amen? The church needs to be careful. Just because somebody looks the part doesn't mean they are the part. And just because they may not look the part doesn't mean that, that God hadn't chose them. His choices was surprising in its requirements, but, but also they were surprising in its reception. After the seven sons have, uh, of Jesse's pass before Samuel and all of them's been rejected, Samuel finds out that there's another son. He's the youngest and he's keeping sheep. He's so insignificant in the family that when the rest of the boys are called, David's not even called. Think about that. All of them's called but David. He's not even been called. He's, listen, he's out doing a job of a humble servant, and when he's mentioned by his father, he, 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 he's not even called by name. Look what Jesse said. Jesse said, he's the what? He's the youngest. <laughs> he, he, yeah, David, he's out there. No, no, no. He's the youngest. Oh, there's one more, the youngest one. Not, hey, there's one more David out in the field keeping sheep. No, no. Je Jesse says in the King James, no, there, there's another one, he, but he's just called the youngest. And when he walks in, Samuel sees this handsome young man, bright-eyed. God tells Samuel, you anoint this one. Could you imagine the rest of those big brawling boys and Daddy Jesse who didn't even call him by name? And I give Jesse a hard time, but I get mad at Jesse. Didn't even call his boy by his name. The one rejected and passed over by the others is the very one that the Lord picked out. And I can, I can you see Jesse and all the sons, they were amazed. Again, we have to be careful how we assess people around us. I, I, have, I love the saying, and the, there was an old song, uh, and I, I, I can remember who sung it and used to listen to it all the time. When others see a shepherd boy, God may see a king. So we need to be very cautious and careful. Can I give you just a, just a little bit more? In 1809, the world was watching uh, with bated breath, as we already mentioned, as, as Napoleon conquered the nation of Austria. And all the cities and the villages and all that stuff fell into the grips. And at that time, the world was wondering if he could ever be stopped. But while that little mad emperor was battling his way around Europe, thousands of babies were entering into the world. But people didn't care for the babies. They were too occupied with the battles. But history, if you will, uh, it has a way, uh, it has a way of, of, of correcting, if you will, or clarifying. That's a better word. It has a way of clarifying things. The war waged... Uh, in 1809, England witnessed the birth of William Gladstone, Alfred Lord Tennyson. Germany greeted a baby named Felix Mendelssohn. America welcomed Edgar Allan Poe, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Charles Darwin, and Robert Charles Winthrop. And in a cabin of an extremely poor family in Kentucky, a little, boy, a little baby by the name of Abraham Lincoln took his first breath. Now, <laughs> over 200 years later, no one but the historians can name one battle that Napoleon fought in 1809. But, <laughs> each one of the little babies that I named came into the world as nobodies. 
but every single one of them left their mark on the world. And we know their name, but you tell me, unless you're a history teacher, probably some of you history teachers couldn't tell me any of the battles that Napoleon won in that same year. But you know the name Edgar Allan Poe. You know the name Abraham Lincoln. What's your point? Listen, no one but God, no one but God knows and sees. Third and final point, going to give you this, we're going to close. God choices, they're specific. It's crystal clear that God had a specific plan in mind. He sent Samuel to a specific town, to a specific family, to pick a specific person that he had chosen to be the next king. How does God choose his? How does he choose? Here's the three points real quick. I'm going to give you these three and we're going to go. He chooses those who are ready. Who are ready. That's why we ought to be ready. Jesse and David's brothers all brought him before Samuel. They're sanctified, verse 5. Their sins are dealt with. They're made ready for worship. Then David's brought in. There's not any time to be sanctified. You see where I'm going with this? He didn't have to be sanctified. Why? Because he's already ready. <laughs> Amen. That's why we ought to live every day ready for when God calls, when you're such a time as this comes. You won't have to be sanctified first. You can walk right in and assume the role. That's what happened with David. God chooses those who are ready. God chooses those who are reliable. When God calls David, he finds him faithfully doing what he's been told to do. Why had David been? He's been told to keep the sheep. <laughs> Isn't that something? There's something to be said about reliability, folks. Just be reliable. He's keeping the sheep. He's doing a dirty, lonely job, but he does it because it's what he's been assigned to do. After he's anointed, guess what he does in verse number 19? He goes back to the flock. <laughs> Amen? I like reliability, don't you? I think it is an awesome character trait. God chooses those who are ready, but God also chooses those who are reliable. Lastly, God chooses those who are redeemed. Samuel anointed David. <laughs> I don't know if that was his first encounter with God or not, but David had seen the glory of God written in the heavens and his power manifested in the universe. David had witnessed God's tender care for his people and his own relationship to his flocks. You can read Psalms 23 and figure out David, the great psalmist, understood the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He knew. <laughs> this little shepherd boy knew. Listen, uh, God doesn't choose the qualified or he doesn't call the qualified but he qualifies the called and if we don't get anything else tonight I hope you get that father we love you thank you for your word how awesome it is to be in your house to study your word thank you for these great stories of King David that we can take and God we can use them in our lives to help us I pray God we wouldn't get so caught up on outward appearances uh, father but we would trust in you to look at a man's heart. God, you know who they are, where they are, and what they're called to do. Uh, help us, God, I pray, uh, just to wait on you sometimes and not get in a hurry uh, because, God, you do all things well. We love you. Now save our loss. Encourage uh, those that are discouraged who are sick. God, bring us back at the next appointed time in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Thank you all. I'll see you Sunday. Just a few more days.